happy public session. I move that we return to the executive session. Yes. McCarthy? Yes. Casson? Yes. The Ross? Yes. Sina? Yes. Stephen? Yes. Tessier? Yes. Yes. We both know this though. So we were in a session a couple months back. We had done a request for proposal by P for a county of record. <coughs> and so that's what we're going to take some action on that. So is there a motion? I made the motion that we appoint uh, the law firm in Jerkin and Jerkin. Second. To represent the commission. Okay. Any comments or questions? Fish. Yes. McCarthy. Yes. Castellan. Yes. DeVos. Yes. 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 As of 9.30, September 30th. We have not received any of our funds from the state for fiscal year 2020. And we won't apparently until an MOU is signed by the Commission and the state. Have we received the refund to us that was not spent on the weed harvest? I, I believe that I read somewhere that they have agreed to give us that refund. Did they agree to give it back to us? Originally, I don't think they agreed to give it back to us. I thought they did. It's in the updated MOU. They haven't agreed. They haven't agreed to give it back to us. They have agreed or they have not. They have not. I'm correct. They have not agreed to give it back. What they wanted to do is to give us a credit off next year. Right. The county wise, this is a nightmare because we got 500000 that we never spent. You can't show you spent it. You know, books, but we'll deal with it. Yeah, they sent us up to the second level. Yeah, right here. It's 50. It's about 56,000. 27. 27. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. 57. Yeah, we're all We're skipped. I'm sorry. We skipped the minutes. Thank you. Let's finish up the treasury. Uh, so we, we, we have 11. There are 11 payments outstanding, uh, totaling $31,996.81. If anybody is curious where that money is going to go, uh, you can see me at the meeting. We have the invoices. Yeah. yeah, we have copies. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so motion passed. We'll move with the bill list. Second. Treasury report. Comment or question? Call roll, please. Fish? Yes. McCarthy? Yes. Castellan? Yes. Devon? Yes. Simon? Yes. Stephen? Yes. Tessier? Yes. And Smith? Yes. Well, I need a motion to approve the minutes. Thank you. Just uh, one small correction. I think it says in the minutes that we did receive the money from them, and it should say it did not. Thank you, Brad. You're welcome. I'll correct that. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Mark, Mark got to me already. <laughs> he did. Okay, he did. So I'll make, I'll make that correction. Make it twice. What did the council say in this letter? Uh, Sorry. I, yeah. I make a motion we approve the, uh, the minutes as corrected. Second.
to the correspondence that land use uh, application. Um, yeah, we, so I reviewed the attack on land use application with their meeting tonight, but there was not any, um, there were no applications that would pose a direct detriment to the water quality of Lake Attacon, so we had no comments on that. Um, I did today send in our draft, or sorry, our report. I'm thinking ahead. We, uh, we sent in our recommendations to Roxbury on 13 King Road. Uh, Bob Pessier waited on that. Thank you, Bob, for your comments. Um, we received a letter from Samuel Klein, uh, our auditor, on um, their recommendations for the commission to receive the full 500000 from the DEP. And um, the other thing is the legal bid packets that were available. The last thing we did receive today, um, Melissa did bring an mail to today in the meeting, so that was wonderful. And we did receive a letter from Senator Sweeney just thanking us for uh, hosting him on the lake and um, his commitment to ensuring that we're, we will receive funds. Yeah. 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 Anybody got any questions on the correspondence? Uh, I'm sorry, you said at the end he assured us we would receive funding. Is that what you said? So that he will be working towards us receiving funding. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. I come foundation update. Hello, everybody. Um, well, we had the late loop yesterday. The late was a good, good community event. A couple hundred people participated. The weather could not have been any better. That was good to see some of the people out and about. Melissa the Park was great with all those people in it, so thank you. Um, we uh, visited the Lake, George, Lake George last week. Uh, Colleen uh, joined us up there. The, the Lake George Fund had invited us up there. It's something we want to get to thread a little bit more about, but they're doing an enormous amount of, I'll say, research and science on the lake. Um, literally hundreds of thousands of uh, data points being collected. Um, they wanted us to see it to see if it might have any um, use here at Lake Pacom. Um, and it's something we, you know, clearly way above my limited science understanding. Um, interesting in that uh, they took some of their technology over to Scaniatus Lake during their algae bloom. Uh, actually, got there shortly before the bloom, and, and they feel that uh, the movement of the water actually was a big factor there creating their room, but you know, I'll, I'll defer. Um, but um, it's just really going to be a question, I think, ultimately, as to um, what's the value of generating all this information, what good can you, it could be used for, who would pay for it. Um, right now, their Lake George Fund is a combination of Rensselaer Polytech, IBM, uh, and Lake George. Um, so interesting. Uh, and we also saw the boat watch afterward. They took us on a tour, which you know, Colin may have some further comments about. And we met also with the Lake George Advisory. So, you know, good, good to share information. The thing I found inter interesting was we all know Lake George is much bigger like the whole pack on, but they have 2,200 homes on it, roughly. Almost the exact same amount we have. So, that's kind of interesting uh, from that standpoint. Um, and they're the only major lake in New York State that has not experienced an algae bloom. They have cold water. They do, but some of the lakes in cold water have experienced algae blooms too. Um, they're pretty proud of that fact that the other like nine of the ten major lakes in New York State have all had algae blooms. But you know, something I'm sure the scientists look at is why. Um, so that was interesting. Um, I'll be at the Delaware the Watershed Forum in the next two days in Allentown. I don't want any cracks about that, but hopefully we'll see what's we'll there. I know uh, Colleen is going to be up at the, the NOMS in that National Association of Lakes in November, I think, with someone from uh, the Lake Hacom Foundation. Um, you know, and I think Brett's going to be there too, right? Uh, one, I will, but one of our scientists will be giving a presentation. And um, now I'll just say that uh, well, one thing the uh, towns of Mount Arlington, Jefferson, and Hacom. All passed resolutions in support of the funding request of the commission. Um, the only reason Roxbury hasn't yet was they haven't had meetings uh, yet, but they, they will, I'm sure, support the next meeting and they already have the, all the appropriate state officials. Um, and finally, I'll just say that 
uh, just from the pure advocacy standpoint, uh, I think uh, the foundation remains very, very optimistic that the Lake of Crafting Commission will receive the funds necessary to do what we were established to do originally. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, uh, just as far as the agenda goes, I think we have more time for our conversation. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, you're right. I'm just kidding. I don't know where it is. Go ahead. So, um, should I do my presentation? Okay. All right. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try my best to keep this limited to 10 minutes. Um, but I'm going to roll out the draft watershed implementation plan. Uh, for Lake Kapatkan and Lake Muskinek, collectively it's called the Upper uh, Muskinekon River Watershed. So the funding for this uh, was provided through the New Jersey Highlands Council. And um, interesting enough, the uh, funding was secured over winter of last year. So th this project was implemented before any of the blooms happened. Now, since then, I've had to retcon the plan. I've, I've added a few additional points that I'll, I'll show you. Um, but um, you can go to the. So, just real quickly, Lake Capacon, largest lake in New Jersey. You, you know there are five municipalities within the watershed, four that have a uh, lakeshore uh, property, uh, mean depth of a little under 19 feet, maximum depth of 58 feet, and more than half a million people visit uh, or live in the watershed. Uh, and then you also have Lake Muskinekon, um, which is a relatively shallow water body with a surface area of 329 acres. It has an average depth of a little under five feet, maximum depth of 10 feet, and it's approximately uh, 1.3 miles downstream of Lake Kapakon. It flushes at a higher frequency than uh, Lake Kapakon. So back in 2001, 2002, uh, New Jersey DEP came up with a, it's called a total maximum daily load, a TMDL, uh, for phosphorus for both lakes. Um, and a TMDL is essentially identifying what your existing load is for a specific pollutant and what the load should be. So I always like to say a TMDL is like putting your lake on a diet. So if this is your existing load, this is your targeted load, you have to reduce that load. Uh, uh, they identify. They identified that the, the load needs to be reduced by about 41%, and here's the required amount of reduction, about uh, 7,200 pounds of phosphorus. Um, so if you think of that back in 2002 when that TMDL came out, um, we worked with the uh, newly created Lake Kapatkan Commission and with Rutgers and we developed a, a, re a restoration plan. And that restoration plan has been used for the last 12 to 15 years to implement a variety of projects. And I've gone through those a number of times. I'm not going to get into them here. But since 2006, when the plan was approved, to the end of 2018, for all the projects that have been implemented in the Lake Kapakon watershed, we've reduced that targeted load by about 32%. So we still have, you know, from the 72, 7,300 pounds, we still have a little under 5,000 to go. So making progress, but it's uh, slow but steady. Lake Muskinekon, now um, in the case of Lake Muskinekon, 76% of its annual phosphorus load originates from the outflow of Lake Pacon. So any reductions in Lake Pacon do help Lake Muskinekon. Lake Mus Muskinekon's specific targeted reduction is a little under 3,000 pounds. But like I said, using uh, some calculations on Lake Kapakon's residence time, we know that we've reduced the phosphorus going in, into Lake Muskinekon by about 1,600. Um, and then also the region, the Lake Muskinekon Regional Planning Board provided uh, uh, us with their uh, nine-year record of weed harvesting. And if you take an average of that, if they remove about 389 pounds of phosphorus per year through their harvesting efforts. So if you take what Lake Kapatkan has done, as well as all the efforts of Lake Muskinekon with their weed harvesting, they need to target another a little light up under 800 pounds of phosphorus to be reduced through their immediate watershed. So both lakes um, 
are, are moving forward in terms of reducing their phosphorus, uh, but Lake Muscanecon's load to be addressed is a lot smaller than Lake Apacon's, and a lot of that has to do with where a lot of the majority of the nutrients are coming into Lake Muscanecon. Uh, I'm going to start getting into some water quality, and, and there are 11 stations. I'm only going to talk about three of the 11 at Lake Apacon, and it's because each one shows a different story. How is the how is the target phosphorus load determined? What this right here. This is how it was determined. It was determined that we want that load to equal an average total phosphorus concentration of 0.03. The what? That's that was that's the state limit. That's that's, that's the, the state limit is actually 0 0.05. That's the state limit. But Lake Apatcon and Lake Muscanetcon have been re recognized as sensitive water bodies. So we recommended that they lower it to 0 0.03. Because when we get above 0 0.03, that's when you start to see more of the algae. So what you see in the literature in general is if your total phosphorus concentration is above 0 0.03, that's when you're going to have a eutrophic productive water body. So this is the mid-lake deep water sampling station. So this is out in the middle of the lake. And you can see from when we approved the restoration plan in 2006 to 2018, the average total phosphorus concentrations in the middle of the lake were generally below that threshold. Note, this ends 2018. So we're still wrapping up doing our analysis of the data from this year. So in December, when we provide the information on the year-end report, we'll provide these graphs and we'll tap 2019 onto these so we can see how, how 2019 reacted compared to everything else. But for the most part, when you look at that long-term data analysis for the mid-lake, the phosphorus concentrations were well below that threshold. Ph uh, phosphorus equals algae, and how we measure algae, uh, one way is through chlorophyll A, so it's the pigment all algae have. The concentration has been hovering around 10, we want to get it down to 8. So it's a little high, but what's interesting is 2014 had an unusually high concentration of chlorophyll A in the middle of the lake, and I know that was the year that the state actually went out and did their first testing for cyanotoxins because of a heavy bloom in certain sections of the lake. So chlorophyll is a little above what we want, but again, the TMBL isn't for chlorophyll, the TMBL is specifically for total phosphorus. And when you look at second depth, so the second disc is an alternating black and white disc, you lower it into the water column. If your water clarity is one meter or greater, that's when most people go, that looks attractive, that looks okay to swim in, it doesn't look nasty. And you can see in the mid-lake section, we were the average second depth was typically greater than two meters, so nice clear water historically in the middle of the lake. If we look at Station 3, which is River Sticks Crescent Cove, not surprising, look at the phosphorus. It's been consistently above that threshold. There have been a few years recently where we've actually seen that average concentration be within that targeted goal, and it's been recent. So that's interesting. Uh, not a large trend, but we have, are seeing these instances. But what's interesting is when you look at chlorophyll A, this is the most dramatic of all the stations, of all the parameters we see. In the River Styx Crescent Cove um, section of the lake, we have seen a measurable decline in chlorophyll A, which makes a lot of sense because we see a lot more weeds, especially over the 2000s, we've seen more plants. So we, what we, what, what's been going on is from 2006 to 2018, in general, the amount of algae in that section of the lake has declined which has allowed more of the weeds and benthic algae to grow. So if you look at water clarity, uh, oh, well, before we do that, I, I do want to emphasize that this, this concept of whether you're getting weeds or whether you're getting algae is called alternative stable states. And this is essentially how it operates, that as nutrient loading increases, you get more algae. If you decrease nutrient loading, you get more plants. Uh, again, this is for shallower sections of the lake or shallower lakes in general. Sunlight's hitting the sediments. If the water's cleared, you're going to get vegetation. If 
there's enough nutrients in the water for the algae to bloom, they cloud up the water and it makes it difficult for the plants to grow. So this is that alternative stable states. And really what flips it is nutrient loading. So that's what we've seen in River Sticks Crescent Cove. We still don't have clear water conditions that we'd like to see in the main body of the lake. But what we have seen over the last almost 20 years is an improvement in the water quality in that less algae, which meant more plants. So, and if you look at that alternative, again, this is just showing you, again, that, that flipping of alternative stable states. Either it's going to be turbid with a lot of algae, or you're going to have clear water with rooted vegetation. And of the two, most people would prefer to have a rooted vegetation. They're easier to manage. You're not having to deal with cyanotoxins in the case of cougar and algae. Um, if you look at clarity, and now remember, River Styx Crescent Cove is a shallow system. But if you look at Seki depth, over time, it has increased. That we've gone from like almost a meter to, you know, going, approaching a meter and a half over the years. Again, this is average water clarity. So Mid Lake sort of stayed the same. River Styx, Crescent Cove improved. Reasons why it improved? Well, number one, we installed those large sedimentation basins that help to improve water clarity. And we actually have some pretty good stormwater data to show when those basins are maintained, they do remove phosphorus and total suspended solids. And the sewering, there was a section of the borough that was sewered, about 40% of the homes were sewered from when the restoration plan was approved to 2018. So those measures have contributed to this reduction in algae in this section of the lake. Now we go to the northern end of the lake. So this is station 10, and you can see that over time, Phosphorus concentrations have indeed increased in the northern end of the lake. We have seen this over time. Uh, again, there's that 0 0.03 threshold. If you look at chlorophyll A concentrations, we have seen an increase in chlorophyll A in that northern end of the lake. And then finally, Seki depth has declined. So it's, it was typically greater than a meter, and it's been approaching a meter, so getting more turbid. So we have some sections of the lake that exhibited improvements, some that exhibited some declines, and then some that really sort of held their own. I do want to point this out because later on top of all this is, and here I did add 2019. So this is, this is just taking the July surface water temperature at the Mid Lake Station. And we have a pretty good database. We have the original study in, in 1988, and then I've gone through the 90s, the aughts and the teens, and if you look at just July, surface water, temperature, we have this statistically significant increase. So we've just, over time, the water has been getting warmer, particularly during the summer season. Again, this is really important because this layers on top of the issues we've been dealing with, particularly this year with the algae. So I'm going to get into the actual whip, and then I'll wrap up with talking a little bit about this year. I'm going to try to do this rapid fire. Um, so we went through and we identified locations for stormwater and stream bank and shoreline management. We used existing land use and line of land cover, but we also conducted some drone surveys. They're pretty cool, cool where we took the drone out and did surveys after storms, I think within 6 to 12 hours of a storm. And those aerial surveys, the data allowed us to do some stormwater sampling. So we identified sections of the uh, lake that need to be considered for restoration. Um, Oops, uh oh, man. There we go. So, and this is just showing you some of the stormwater locations. So, we had two at Lake Musconetcon, we had three at Lake Apacon, but again, we really wanted to focus more on the restoration projects, not too much on the water quality data. Um, and so, what we did was we used the information we had, and we identified 27 sites throughout the Lake Apacon watershed, and there were some also identified in Lake Musconetcon. Uh, Lake Musconetcon's immediate watershed, but I'll get into that in a little more detail. Um, note that the, the estimated pollutant removal and implementation costs are provided in the plan. The, these costs are for implementation. They do not include design, engineering, permitting, and monitoring. We specifically did that because to assess utility conflicts, depth to bedrock, depth to water table, permit requirements, ownership, easements, right of ways, maintenance requirements, the cost for that can be extremely variable. So if you're doing a planting of a shoreline, 
You may require no permitting. It may require you know no uh, no one call. It could be a pretty easy implemented project. But other projects that may uh, require considerable earth moving uh, may need uh, some flood hazard permits. The cost can be substantial. So one of the things that we're recommending and that we've included uh, for consideration for the um, commission's annual uh, budget, as well as some stuff that we're asking for relative to the um, New Jersey Highlands Council, is to do engineer grade assessments of these sites before we actually ask for funding. This is based on experience we've had over the last 10 years, that when we've gotten 319 grants, very frequently, we haven't done these engineer grade assessments, so we, we have to do that when we go out. That ends up wasting a lot of time and money because now we have to look for the right of ways and the easements, we have to look for the utility lines. Is there, is there a sewer line in that area? Is there a fiber optic line? Um, so if we can get this information hashed out right away, it makes these projects more shovel ready. We actually ask for implementation funds. So I just want to go through very quickly some of these sites. Now, with conversations we've had with DEP, uh, they don't want to see as many of the manufacturer treatment devices. Um, I explained to them that those devices in the lake community sometimes are a necessary evil, that you have very little room for large stormwater structures in the lake communities. You have a lot of small lots with a lot of homes and that these underground structures really help to remove a lot of the uh, nutrients. So we did come up with a compromise. A lot of the projects I'll be showing you are more green infrastructure, so that they're using plants and soil and, and stuff to remove phosphorus, but also we have included some of those manufactured treatment devices as well. Also, some of these recommended sites come from a Rutgers study that was done as well, and that's cited in the plan. So this is one location that we we were talking about doing a biofiltration system, almost like an expanded rain garden in this section, but also something that we've talked um, with the commission and the foundation quite a bit is these existing catch basins. If you can put some sort of filter media in there, that company that manufactures a, a product called biochar, which is essentially a, a wood material, and if you're interested in it, you can look at that biochar now. Um, but the material is substantially lower in cost than many of the other filter media. We're recommending as part of next year, as part of the demonstration projects, let's tr try some of this product and evaluate how it works. But in this case, we're looking at a some sort of biofiltration system in combination with the filter media. Um, there are, uh, so this is at the state park. This is one of the low hanging fruit projects that we're recommending the, the, um, for next year that the state park and the commission and the foundation we get together and we do a little bit of regrading and replanting of this uh, biofiltration system at the state park. It was it was very effective when it was operating. It just needs a little bit of maintenance, putting up a little fence, and then we're good to go. So this is a low hanging fruit this project. Water, this was a water garden. Is that right? Yes. Water? Yes. Yep. So that would be one. So it, it it takes all the runoff not only from the parking lot but from the rooftops. So this is the one we want to do a little bit of regrading a little bit of replanting and then putting up a little fence. And this was the one hundreds of thousands of dollars was spent on? Because it had to redirect a lot of runoff. So, but the cost to, to, to retro, to, to, to redo this would just be, you know, we were talking about not, I mean, you're essentially paying for plants. And if you have volunteers do the work, it's going to be minimal. So this is definitely a low hanging fruit project we'd like to implement next year. Um, there are a number of basins that we found that look like this, that Basins like this just are screaming to be retrofitted so that they could be vegetated and be used to assimilate nutrients as opposed to being like a flume ride for nutrients. So, you know, a basin like this, very frequently what we do is it's already an existing structure, so maybe putting in some berms, so instead of having the water shoot right to the outflow, it sort of has to meander, putting a lot of vegetation in here. Again, that, that green infrastructure helps to remove a lot of the dissolved phosphorus, which is really the candy for the algae. So this is one site. There are uh, other sites. So, so this is uh, in the Lake West Connecticut watershed. This would be a larger biofiltration system. I was really intrigued by this because we did a very similar large biofiltration system at, um, at Manalapin Park. 
in Jamesburg from the Nalican Lake, so it was a parking lot, and we retrofitted this whole thing, did a curb cut, and it was very effective at removing phosphorus and nutrients before they go in the Nalican Lake. Um, there, again, are a number of these basins that look like this, and, and, and you know, to regrade them, do a little bit of, of work inside, doing the plantings, I mean, this could really go a long way in enhancing and removing a lot of the nutrients. The nice thing about these basins, too, is they're not like the Filterra systems that are only taking care of less than an acre. You're probably talking about, you know, 12 to 20 acres maybe draining into these basins, so you could really do a number in terms of removing a substantial amount of nutrients before going into the lake. It's actually Roxbury. Yes, that is, oh, I'm sorry, you're right, that is Roxbury. I, I apologize. Um, I, I, I was getting this off from, um, from Pat, who's been putting all the, uh, all the sheets together on this. Um, so these are two detention basin, wet pond systems. These are in Mount Arlington. One is above the other. And I would definitely say that this is a basin because of this structure here. And it's really important to say that in front of DEP, that this is a structure so that the permitting goes, it is either goes away or it's a lot simpler. So I look at these and I see these as structures. But what I see is something that can really be enhanced in terms of maybe removing some of the sediment, recreating some of the contours so that the water just doesn't shoot through the system, and also putting in some vegetation. Um, we did a wet pond system in Roxbury as part of the, I believe it was part of the targeted watershed plan, and some of the highest pollutant removals for phosphorus we've gotten at all the BMPs is at that Roxbury basin. So it was a, it was a retention basin we converted into a wetland pond, and it, was, it's, it has like 80% removal of phosphorus. So that's what we'd like to see done with these as well. So they're tucked out of the way, and you could really enhance them with quite a bit of it. Now that was created when they put this sewer system. Mm -hmm. That's that, that's what we yeah that's what we found out and had to do a little bit of investigation. Um, there are some sites like here at Jefferson. There's some sites that you know we may need to do some of those manufactured treatment devices. You're just seeing you know obviously the runoff would come down into this basin. Um, most of the manufactured treatment devices function just as settling. The stormwater, the heavier particles, and when you do that, you're only getting about 30 to 40 percent removal of phosphorus. But again, I mentioned that filter media that we've been talking about, the biochar, if it's reasonable in cost, and so it's not expensive and easy to maintain, that can increase the removal rates by at least 80 percent. And it's and that filter media is taking care of the dissolved phosphorus. That's the stuff that the algae will use right away. So um, there are ways of enhancing those manuals. Uh, and then again, another one of those sites where we could do a, um, a biofiltration system. Again, I'm conveying this as much as possible to DEP that we're looking for these green infrastructure technologies because there's sometime during this month they're supposed to make an announcement on request for proposals under the 319 program. So we want to have these proposed projects in mind when they ask uh, for uh, so of the 27 projects, um, if we just some of the back of the envelope calculations, we, we've estimated about 188 pounds of phosphorus would be removed. If you equate that to algae, that's about a quarter of a million pounds of algae per year. Uh, it would remove about um, 473,000 pounds of sediment. And then the implementation costs, again, I provided a, a cost of about 4 million Earlier this summer, I had the engineers do a more rigorous analysis for the study. It came between 3.3 and 4.6 million dollars. Um, we also did something we did not do with the original restoration plan. We did stream bank shoreline assessments. We used the New, New Jersey DEP stream habitat assessment. We actually developed a protocol specifically for the highlands with this methodology. So our stream people did that. Total of 16 stream bank sites were assessed. We also assessed a total of nine shoreline locations. And we're currently wrapping up the pollutant, pollutants removed and the associated costs for these. So these are locations of the stream bank or shoreline stabilization sites. And just to sh throw a couple out at you, so this is a uh, bridge crossing, and very frequently you'll see this. 
you know, above a culvert, that's a pretty large one, but you'll see these large sediment bars, you know, removing the sediment bars, doing some vegetation, and if there is some sort of weir, maybe possibly removing the weir. There's also some sites where we're rec we are recommending removing smaller culverts, replacing them with larger ones so you don't have that concentration of water and nutrients and uh, debris accumulating on the upper end of the culvert. Um, anything that said park, I put up high because parks are, you know, a, a county park, a local park, anything like that, this would be relatively easy to regrade, put some vegetation in here to really remove a lot of the nutrients that would come from this site, um, would go a long way. Um, and then we have a number of them that, that uh, are on the Muskinacon River that would obviously benefit uh, Lake Muskinacon. So there's about five or six sites that we have where, again, this is like a flume ride coming out. If you could do some regrading here, put some riprap and some vegetation, even a plunge pool here that could be maintained from time to time, it would help to reduce the nutrients that are going into uh, uh, the Muskinacon River, which then goes into uh, Lake Muskinacon. And then there's some shoreline planting sites. So again, nine of them. Some of them may require some regrading, which will require some permitting. Others, if you just do some vegetative planting, you know, little to no permitting. And these are the sort of projects, either with private property owners or with parks. I really see the commission, if the commission had a sustainable um, source of funding, I could see them, you know, funding projects like this, where you could have volunteers coming in, doing the planting, uh, maybe doing a little regrading with hand tools and doing the planting and putting up the gooseneting. This would really go a long way in, on those locations where it's not, you're not causing problems relative to marinas or you're not having issues relative to access. You're looking for those sites that are eroded um, but have little to no vegetation. Those are the sites you really want to focus on. Installing that vegetation that helps to trap those nutrients. Uh, and then again, this is, I, I believe this is Ingram Cove, but this site here, I mean, yes, there's a boat launch here, but these areas here, if they're not being used, I just would really want to see vegetation at least as high as your knee. It can be removed at the end of the uh, fall season, but there's a wide variety, very attractive native vegetation, and it really does go a long way in removing the nutrients that otherwise go into the receiving uh, waterway. Um, Something I had to add to this uh, because of this year, uh, sewering of the Lake of Pacon watershed. So this wasn't part of the original whip, but with the blooms going on, people were asking, well, what if we sewer the lake? So um, Roxbury and Mount Arlington are essentially sewered. About 40% of the homes within the section of the borough of Pacon within the watershed are sewered. None of the homes within Jefferson are sewered. So we ran some models. Uh, first of all, we did mention that, you know, State Park, we should take them off septic and have them hooked up to the uh, sewer facility. Um, what if we completed the sewering at Hapacon and we sewered all the homes within Jefferson, including Lake Shawnee, and I just threw in some various loading coefficients, and if the entire watershed was sewered, we'd be able to address 60 to 100 percent of it of the phosphorus targeted under the TMPL. Mm -hmm. So you could get a large chunk. So take them an average of that 80%. So you figure 80% of the phosphorus could just be removed by sewering the entire watershed. The remaining 20% would be these projects that I'm talking about, these stormwater projects. Um, so this would really go a long way in terms of removing that phosphorus that otherwise stimulates these algae. Um, Oops, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Try to give me. Um, so yeah, uh, one more forward. Yeah. So um, to retcon this, I you know so originally, like I mentioned, the watershed implementation plan we started work at the beginning of the year. It was something that was being done prior to the blooms. But once the bloom hit, you know, working with the commission and the foundation, developed this four point strategy. Um, because of these blooms, how do we deal with them? Well, number one is the WIP that we're working on. So the draft document I'm hoping to do is, you know, Pat and I are going to be wrapping up the appendices, and I mentioned the tables uh, for the stream bank and shoreline projects, and then what we'll do is we'll email a digital copy to the commission, as well as to the um, foundation and, and uh, obviously the New Jersey Highlands Council. Um, 
we also have three other components that we mentioned, the in-lake demonstration project. What can be done in the water to take care of some of these blooms proactively? Beach restoration plans. So the beaches are where we're really concerned with the cyanotoxins because that's where most people have the direct contact with the water. Can we have these, these projects that are targeting the beach areas as opposed to stormwater and, and septic? So the beach restoration plans are critical. And then investigations to better manage the lake. So there are a lot of questions that are coming up. For example, you know, is aeration important? Well, some investigation is required for that. I do want to conclude by showing, you know, I, you know how the lake has been green. Well, the other lakes in the region are suffering through similar blooms. So this is Lake Kerry, one of our clients up in the Poconos. This was taken by one of our clients on the 11th of October. So they're still suffering through some blooms. Last week when Marty uh, and um, Colleen were at uh, Lake George, I was in New York City. We were meeting with, the New, Jersey, with uh, New York City's um, um, Central Park Conservancy. They, they want to hire us to manage their lakes. And the lake, which is the water body where people row on, was bright green. This was last Thursday, bright green. And the way it's situated is the wind blows right along that area. If you're familiar with the fountain and the bridge, um, one of the guys I was with goes, oh, this is from the movie Buddy, Buddy. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, all right. But anyway, I guess a lot, of, a lot of movies are filmed there. But a lot, they said this is their prime area. And talking to the person, the staff member who collects the samples for cyanotoxins, he said, this is nothing. Okay, August, you know, the foam of the algae could be this thick. So um, they were going through the same thing. And this is just another shot. This is showing Lake Apacon on the 18th of October in 2017. So we have seen these blooms occur uh, late in the season. And I can tell you that our potable water clients are, are freaking out because they're still suffering through these blooms. And again, part of this is climate change. Um, the part that we're really focusing on to try to control these algae blooms are reducing the fuel that, that they need feed on, which is the phosphorus. So I believe that's what I have, so thank you for your time. I'm, I'm sure that was beyond the 10 minutes, so I apologize for that. Next, we have Linda Spears here from the Morris County Soil Conservation. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm the chairman of the Morris County Soil Conservation District. We've never been here before, so you're probably wondering why I am. And um, the soil district is, uh, how familiar you are with it, but it's a quasi judicial organization that um, we have to self fund our ourselves. And we oversee all construction in the county. Uh, in addition, we have flexibility to other things. I've been, you know, with the Lake of Pacan situation, I've been wanting to think of a way we can help. I think like everyone else. And ironically, my opportunity to help stems from the fact that. Um, we've owned a home on Lake George for 20 years, and so up there we've been very um, uh, active with and knowledgeable of what Lake George does to preserve its lake. I think you can say it's from um, they, uh, Lake George, we just attended the uh, 143rd annual meeting of the Lake George Association, so they've been at this a long time. Um, they've been, RPI has been running. Uh, water sampling on the lake for decades in the 70s, and my husband was Michael Battle, the student there. He did some of the testing, and they created a lot of foundation and raised a lot of money on the lake. And they've been very uh, concerned about preserving our lake because although they've never had a bloom, they feel that they can have a bloom at any time. Uh, they, um, and, and recent five years ago, I, the, uh, Kind of one of those unique things. Um, the president of RPI and the senior uh, executive director at IBM, a head of R&D, both have houses on the lake. And they got together with the fund for Lake George and said, what can we do? And so um, they, um, they decided that within five years, they wanted to have the smartest and cleanest lake in the world. They've done that. How did they do that? IBM uh, came in and with technology from RPI, they set up, um, they have 50,000 monitors all around the lake. They're collecting the data every quarter of a second. They're putting it through because IBM has lots of computers, they can analyze 
um, this data. And there, at this point, a lot of what they're doing is they're understanding what's happening. When there's a flush through the um, through their um, sensors, they can uh, they know exactly where uh, if a contaminant comes in, they know exactly where it came from. They know which stewards are a problem. They're handling. Um, they're working with all of that. Um, earlier this um, summer, when uh, actually just a few weeks ago, I was at um, an event where um, where they were bringing us up to date on this um, on this project. It's actually called the uh, Jefferson Project. Uh, the um, when the IBM, the senior executive VP of IBM, came up to me and said, um, "You're from New Jersey. We would um, we really like to have a like a pack And uh, can you um, uh, can you help us?" I said, "I don't know. I can I can make some calls and see what I can find out." And so this is kind of where this whole arrangement began. And um, so. Um, uh, and I, I made the contact and uh, and just then got in touch with um, with the funds like we're just the one that's, that's running it. And so we arranged for them to come up within just a just a couple of weeks. And there's so many um, different aspects of it that they, they want to share uh, with you at this point. Um, IBM is learning a lot of their um, the data as well. So the, um, they came up uh, uh, the um, and who the, the fund for Lake George had there, they had three scientists from IBM. They had the water keeper. Um, Lake George has one of the 200 water keepers uh, in the country uh, that, that exist. And they had um, elected officials from some of the local communities because a big component of this is, you know, Lake George, like Lake Patakon, has a lot of um, different communities who all have just like you, we all have our individual ordinances. We all have, um, and you know, we all we all have the same issues that have to go through, um, and the funding that's necessary. How how they work with that, how they're working together to make um, Lake George, and it is one of the greatest clean uh, in in the world. And they've gone beyond the a lot of the others. They've now into um, uh, they realize the salt runoff is, is very important to its changing. And so there's just so many different things they're um, they're learning it. So um, and and one thing is that they incorporate a big part of this, they have mandatory boat washing. You can't go on the lake without having your uh, boat washed. Fifty percent of the boats that come onto Lake George are from other communities. And not all boats are allowed in, even after they're washed, they can still be turned away because there's it's necessary. They can't have any more um, invasives that come on to the lake, and they haven't had any new invasives since they started the, um, the boat washing. So I think kind of um, the, the next step, and, and then if you have any questions, I'm happy to handle those. What you're probably asking yourself is, why does Lake George want to help Lake Chicago? And the reason they want to do it is they know that fresh water is important for all of us. And Lake George can't have the only fresh water in the world. You know, we all need we all need fresh water. And the other the other aspect to it is, is that Lake George realizes that other areas um, are threats to Lake George and a lot of people are coming up. And ironically, one of the lakes that's considered a threat to Lake George is Lake Apopkin. There's a lot of boats that come from Lake Apopkin up to Lake George. Um, some, I, I see some shaking. Probably some of you have, have done that. And part of this, the, um, the whole Lake George philosophy is you want to treat them before it's a problem. You want to treat them at, at the source rather than, um, than, than after you have a problem. So in terms of the, um, the next steps, I think that uh, they, they're committed to coming down and meeting with a uh, group from down here that um, is um, Probably makes it a little easier for more people to be involved and have an opportunity to um, to do it. And they they not officially but unofficially um, committed to um, helping fund 50% of the boat washing station down here because they see it as that's how important they feel it is and they feel they can benefit from it. So they're really uh, you know this is kind of their this is why they're involved. This is why they care. And I kind of assume that the time. So.
Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Very good. Do they have visual okay. tournaments on Lake George? Of course, and they have a big sailing association. I know uh, Lake of Hot Con Yacht Club is a, an affiliate with the Lake George Club. But yeah, no, and they, they stop the fish to, um, for no, they have a lot of lake trout. And so one of their big threats is they don't want any of those uh, invasive fish from, uh, to get to get the lake. Uh, from the um, breakfast, which have been contaminated with, uh, with fish to eat the lake trout. I'm told I had a 19 inch one under my dock this summer. I don't know. How are they able at their own fish stations to service all those at all the uh, fishing tournaments when, when they all arrive at the same time to be in the way? Um, you know, as far as I know, they, you know, they do it. I don't know. I don't know how they do that. Uh, they have um, all of the entrances now. Uh, they probably have several locations where they can. They have several boat portion stations. I think maybe other. Whether what they keep them moving quickly. No, they have people like the gas stations. You can pull in. And have well, to wash. well, one of the things, and the state has been very um, supportive too. They now have. Um, I think it's about 20 miles, 20 or 30 miles outside of Lake George. They have a washing station now. So you, there's a lot of different places. You don't have to get washed at, right at the lake. There are places along the way that you can. I was just wondering, does our whip talk address anything in the washing station? No, the whip is specifically for phosphorus. Now, we do have a public education component. I know from the original restoration plan, we did have some information on invasives. Um, so we can provide that information, and we can talk about boat washing under the uh, educational component. It was going to say that's something else. They have maps and know where all of their invasives are on the lake and have their regular um, remediation that they can do. I mean, some of them, the Asian clans will never get rid of, but you can continue to put a certain uh, number of them out of the <clears throat> well, as everybody knows by now, we've had, we had a nice visit with Senator Sweeney and some members of the uh, staff down in uh, Trenton. We had a nice tour of the lake. Um, and he was impressed, I believe, with the size of the lake and, and, and the seriousness and seemed very, very willing and staff to lend their support to finding some kind of funding to solve some of the problems. As a follow-up to that, the governor will be coming up next month at some point to make his pitch and I guess throw in his support. I guess we've got their attention, which is a, an important thing at this point. We want to talk about these committees. I mean, we have everybody turned in their sheets of their preferences for committees. We have to sponsor everybody now. I think that we're missing a couple of responses. Well, I need to take it with me tonight. I want to look at them. Um, I don't know how to buy the old work. Is it? I know my most of my experience with public bodies and boards of education, in which case the president of the board takes the same kind of suggestion as the members and then makes the appointment. There's no vote on it. But the Bible says the board votes on it. Otherwise, I'll probably take a look at it and we'll wait for the next meeting to vote on it. Or if not, I'll make some phone calls to some of you and we'll. I don't think there's any provision in the bylaws. Yeah, I, I, think, I think if I remember, I was going to say I think the appointment is made by the chairman. Okay. No so let me look it over and see what we got. I will certainly be at least in touch with the people that are, that I think might make. A good chairman to be productive and so get their okay and throw out the committee. So, how many more before I leave tonight? Would you give me that? What you have? Um, I can email it to you. Email. Email. Okay, email. Thank you. Okay, that's what I, I have there. So, I think we're uh, something's going to happen with funding. I don't know how much and from where, but there's several people that are into it. There's a couple of assembly bills in which the governor's office has made contact with the assembly people in order to work on those bills together. We've got kind of a
supportive commitment as of the president. I'm sure we're going to get a supportive commitment as the governor. So one way or the other, I think we're going to get some uh, That's great. That's great. We'll move along with some of the stuff that you got here, Brad. Yeah, um, something I did forget to mention that um, over the last few weeks, I have been getting um, emails from DEP. They've been asking for information on the past projects, very specific information. So I think they're compiling information. They want to know, well, what, especially with the targeted watershed grant, because that was an EPA grant, so they didn't have that information. So I have been feeding them information on the projects that have been completed. Thank you. That's all I have, I guess, at this point. So I'm going to start with Dr. Fred. You want to kind of comment? No, no comments. No comments at this time. No comments. But we have a, one comment this uh, October 11th letter from Melvin Quarry. Again, which I brought up at the last meeting, we're only talking about the on site stream near the lake, but there's no what? reference in there to, to the quarry. There's no reference to the basin. And I know at the last meeting I asked on the previous one, Princeton Hydro was going to go out and do some quantity estimate for how much of that. We did, so we did a baseline water quality sample. We did not do any. Did we talk about measures. seeing what the depth of that measurement was? You talked about it, but there was, there was nothing. Like you. There was nothing formalized or anything. Would we need to make a motion to have that done? Yeah. You, you got to ask me. Well, I did. Okay. I I did reach out to DEP after that, and I sent an email to everyone letting them know that DEP is assessing the sediment in the lake. Um, but it doesn't, just so you have that background information, which will be in the most recent. So DEP was out there collecting data, and I think that's why we were in a holding pattern. So you think they did core sample? I mean, it'd be nice to know how much junk is in that cone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not just look down, oh yeah, there's stuff there. Well, I think the uh, difficulty you might find is being able to attribute how much of that you're able to attribute um, to the quarry. Just how, how, how much have you gotten? How much have you gotten? You can quantify it because it's different than the material underneath it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, it's, 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 it's a fine gray dust. But it's from the quarry. If the quarry stone is the same as the bedrock that's all around, no. from a legal standpoint, it is the same. Well, why don't, no, why don't no. we take some? Samples from some other locations, control samples. Well, I mean, I think we should. Why are we going, going back and forth? I can not to exceed. What do you, you got a number you think? Not I can put a scope to work together on that. I'll, I'll put a scope to work together. together. I can get it to you. Yeah. This one to write check. Yeah, all right. Right, and the chairman will just approve it because we talked about it for three minutes. Yes. Greg, you got to look in the budget and see what I, what we, I'll, I'll call you when I get a number from him. To see you don't know how many pounds you're talking about, what the thickness is. Well, I mean, the other thing, too, is we have data we collected three, four years ago in the area. So the nice thing about that is we'll have, and if you mentioned doing control, so we do a control code and add that code. You see what we have data from four or five years, years ago compared to now, we can get an idea of rates of segmentation. That's great. That's all I have. Okay. Um, just, just uh, you, you, uh, Tony, you sent us an analytical result summary table of surface water sample. Did everybody get that? That was uh, in an email. Yeah, was that just today? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that that's available. This was on a surface water sample, and uh, basically, I, I don't know, Fred, you want to take a look at this, please, because I don't understand. It. Yeah, I looked at it. Quite frankly, I don't, I don't know the significance of it. I don't think any of it. If, if you look at it in milligrams per liter, it's 320, which is it's kind of high for total dissolved solids. The um, uh, the total suspended solids, which are the larger particles, was not detect. So it's, it's that very, very fine material, almost like that clay-like material. That's what that's telling me. I mean, everything else. You know, looks. What you know, about the uh, sort of a lead figure there? That was disturbing to me. Well, the lead is it's it's non detect. It's ND. I, I, lead total non detect ND. 
the concentration. Is there another column? There There's another column, but the other columns are like the minimal detection limit, you oh, know, the recovery limit. Oh, um, there's no limit. No, it says non-detect. <laughs> a direct line in Europe. <laughs> like phosphorus was low, the phosphorus was 0 0.015. The thing that stands out to me is the dissolved substances that I had this year. It's interesting, if I understand it, with the algae bloom, the one code or the one area that's still of concern is, is in that code. Mm -hmm. Where where Weldon Quarry is. And that's the only one that still is testing positive. Over twenty thousand. Isn't that correct, Tony? Yeah. If somebody tests it, you won't know. So I'm concerned. He doesn't test it based on based on what I'm not saying it's right or wrong, I'm just saying they do it based on what reports are made. Them. So if they're not getting reports, then they don't go back out to test it. So, so if we see something, we have to call them now. Exactly. So if you see something that you think should be tested, then it should be reported. Or that you said you think is a harmful algorithm, then you should be reported. The last couple of days, I've had some green slime at my dock, which had, wasn't there mm -hmm. since uh, it's June. And keep in mind, these, these, these samples were collected August 29th. Yes. Uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's not really, it doesn't really look like typical blue green algae. It's not that dense. Mm -hmm. There's really no blue in it. Mm -hmm. But it is of, of some concern. Well, be careful too. Blue green algae doesn't mean they all look blue green. Some of them look red, some of them do look white, some of them look brown, some of them look gray. So unless you look at it under the microscope, you know. Yes, yeah. I understand. So, Frank, um, for your future comments, I have um, a couple of quick questions. You mentioned the filter media in the catch basins uh, and the cost of that. Mm -hmm. Can we take that further and figure out what's needed in the way of staffing and schedules and frequency? We're actually working on that, putting together a proposed study um, that we're going to submit for consideration for the New Jersey Highlands Council on the existing basins. Removing the material that's in there, so we're putting costs together for that putting in this filter medium and evaluating the effectiveness of this new medium. So we're, 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 we're currently working on prices for that. Okay, the next question is um, directed to both Colleen and Fred. At the, at the um, July meeting of the commission, and subsequently you guys questioned the uh, whereabouts of the data that the commission staff collected in the early 2000s regarding the location of all the test stations, their construction type, their needs, maintenance, things like that. Did we ever, I think some of that information was found in boxes, we did locate the boxes. So is there any way that those boxes can be made useful or, or relevant to what's going on now? Because a lot of time actually was spent by the commission staff back then gathering that information and I think it would fall right in place nicely with just about everything that Fred talked about this evening. Yes, um, so those boxes were scanned, um, and I will all do the scanning to I think that is kind of put on the back burner. Yeah, one of the things I mentioned with the engineer assessments, uh, one thing we talked about, and again, we're, we're proposing maybe to uh, cover some of the costs with that through the New Jersey Highlands Council, is not only would they be looking at those sites, but I, I talked to our staff about also Fanning out and looking at existing catch basins and what ones would be eligible for filter media, which ones would need to be, the, the catch basin would literally need to be replaced. So we have an idea of cost of, well, will these five could just be retrofitted, these five need to be replaced. So that's the type of information we want to collect in addition to looking at easements and right ways and all that. Yeah, well, my point is this data is already out there. It is, but keep in mind that data, think about how old that data is. Oh, I know. And the condition of those bases could be substantially different yeah. than what so 
That data is very valuable, but at the same time, those field assessments are critical to figure out actual costs and implementation. I'm also thinking about the location and yes. the old drain tube, yep. because I can just speak to the catch cases that I see in my town and I walk around my neighborhood and I look at. I gotta tell you, not much has changed over the years. Yeah, I mean, they've deteriorated. Right, right. Or they fit, fit, they filled in for a year or something like that. That's all I've seen. Thank you. Updates. What's that? You're up. Week one. Well, a couple of updates. Um, we have submitted an application for water lowering for the drawdown. I'm waiting for it to be reviewed and um, to be issue a permit. Uh, this year would be the 22 inch drawdown. Uh, the water level, as you guys may already know, currently is at 7.7, 7, which is approximately 15 and a half inches below crust. The we harvest is update. We've done that. We we harvest it, correct? We're going to do we harvest it. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, yeah, we're going to do the we harvest it. No, but we, we've done cutting that, right? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 What did you say the number was? Oh. Today, uh, would, you, would you please speak louder? I, I can't hear you. Yeah, the acoustics is good. Absolutely. Hey, okay, easy now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a train station because of the mobile sound. Um, huh. Speaker. Okay. This is the reason I thought before. Let's see. Oh, okay. Conversion. Yeah. 8.32. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, in other words, the point being, we have not started dry down yet, I'm still waiting for the permit. Um, as far as the wheat harvesting program goes, we are off the lake. As of today, uh, we wrapped up last week. The equipment is currently at Hapakon State Park. Can you hear me? No, I can. Okay. Um, the equipment is being power washed, power washed at the park. And once that's done, it will be transferred to the Franklin building. Um, the disassembly process will begin. That will include the small harvester, which will be refurbished for 2020 to be put on the water along with the rest of the machine. Um, the contractor for roof repair has been selected, so they should be starting in November. Um, I'm sharing this because it affects the Lady Fact Commission office. Uh, as soon as all that work is done, uh, we will let you know. I'm just recommending once the remediation begins that you temporarily store your files and supplies that you can move away from your office. Put them in my office or in the back. Um, the total cubic yardage uh, harvested this year from mid May to October 30th was 1,284 cubic yards. In how much? 1,284. And what did we do last week? 4,000? We were close to 4,000, a little over 4,000. And, and it still costs us 355 to cut the weed. Well, remember, you got $61,000 back. Out of that $355. So, so, so we got a quarter of what we got. I know. Um, that would cover the weed harvesting program. As far as, oh, okay, the next topic was the weld inventory. I will read to you the report we received from Mr. Spini with the Office of Water Compliance and Enforcement. Please find below the New Jersey DEC monthly weld and update for the October 13th Lake Effect Commission meeting. When the last month Walden conducted, when the last month Walden conducted with NJDC oversight and extensive cleanup in the tributary that they discharged sediment to in February of 2019, the cleanup consisted of both manual and mechanical removal of sediment and utilized multiple frack trucks and a frack tank. The tributary cleanup is mostly complete and is expected to prevent the further migration of any significant quantities of poor material from entering Lake of Pacon. Weldon is required to regularly monitor the tributary and remove any residual sediment 
the accumulation of sediment may be considerable. So the plantation. The areas disturbed during the cleanup will be restored with a riparian seedling and hay for stabilization. Walden has completed the New Jersey DEP required monthly monitoring of their circuit board discharge for August 2019. The results are attached for your records and will comply with effluent limits in the current NJDEP mining and quarrying discharge for circuit board or permit. The discharge terminated in September, so there are no monitoring results in September. NJDEP fisheries biologists conducted a fish survey of the affected coastal lake pack on October 10th. NJDEP will share the findings of this survey when a report has been generated. Lastly, NJDEP intends to meet with Walden shortly to discuss their NJDES permit and related next steps. The MOU draft was submitted. I believe Colleen shared with the commission. Mm -hmm. um, is, that, is that ever revised, that grip? Yes. Who made the name room remove the clause about the other one? Who took out of it? Mm -hmm. Is that back in now? We'll put that back in. Okay. Mm -hmm. And as far as the CAC meeting and water level management update, I shared. Let's just pay for it. We'll do that next. 
What's the CAC meeting? Yeah. Did, did Josh schedule the CAC meeting? Not yet. Oh, I was about to share that with you guys. I sent an email out uh, stating that we met with the assistant commissioner. We're waiting on the next step from their office on the process, and something should come out shortly. Can I, can I point out, please, to the DEP that this has been going on now, I think, for two years, planning the next meeting. Yes. The, 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 next, the next proposal is due at the very latest, 2021, which means that in 2020, uh, that's going to have to be approved. And the DEP is going to insist that not only will there be a CAC meeting, but there'll be probably multiple meetings. And then um, everybody uh, else has to be notified of any changes before they are possibly approved. So this delay is making it very, very difficult for a change in which most of us favor a potential change in those drawdown rules and, and the way the lake level is handled. So I think that this is now an urgent matter that, that needs immediate attention to call that meeting. I, I would say that some of the specifics, some very minor focus points that need adjustment, the unbalance, I don't think the whole plan should be chucked and reinvented because mm -hmm. a lot of time was spent in 2011 mm -hmm. putting the plan together. Fine tuning, adjustments, meetings after major drawdowns, everything that we discussed and voted on at the commission level, all that stuff should be looked at. But they shouldn't throw the whole thing out and rebuild from overnight. I'm not suggesting. That's the first point. The second point is this 22 inch drawdown. Um, it, according to the plan, we're supposed to have a 26 inch drawdown. It was made 22 inches for purposes of a pilot program. So I just want to be on record as stating that this is supposed to be a 22 inch pilot mode, and I assume we're still in pilot mode. And then, of course, that would take the question of well, when is the CAC going to need to look at this pilot program and data and what that means? So I just want anybody to think that the 22 inch is set in stone. It's not what the plan calls for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I exchanged some emails with Commissioner Stevens and we had a brief meeting at my office and I know after that Commissioner Stevens spoke with Commissioner Steinbaum and there was a document prepared and, and then after that document was prepared I had somebody in my family close family member pass away so the past two weeks have been kind of work. So that document that we prepared, Todd, I thought was very good and focused. And yeah, we just need to tweak that a little bit again for the rest of the commission. Yeah. Then I think the plan would be to present the work of this committee to the commission, and then at that point take it out to municipalities. Agreed. calculations based on the number of gallons that of water we'd be sending away from our watershed 
to the MSA, not to mention that the MSA has already gone to the, to the DEP previously and said, because of the number of sewer customers we have, we need more water from Lake Apacom for passing flow for the Lake Dilute to the loop, you know, not, you know, generally. And, and so it's very important that we don't over sewer, we need to target it. And then speaking of targeting, all right, so I used to work for NASA years ago, and I would look at satellite, I would actually work with scientists that developed some science, the spectrometry that I believe is being used here. So the EPA has a site, and just on October 12th, the satellite was overhead, and you can see now that Lake Apacon is essentially surrounded again by algae. So the DP is only testing based on their formula, the ones that have been failing, but we have the algae again. The interesting thing is, for instance, it's my friend's house. You can see it, it goes, it was at the state park during the lake loop. Okay, but did people complain about rashes? I don't think so. So we have a regulatory thing to consider also. The regulatory thing is, Greenwood Lake has already told the DEP they're not going to pay attention to. Um, the, the, I, I'm asking that the, that the commission. Um, Look at what the Greenwood Lake is doing because the the bathing rules do not require closure for anything but bacteria E. coli bacteria, mm -hmm. and and yet they and, and even Lake Pack on News mentions the the warning is the the danger is of twenty thousand cells and toxins at a certain level. We never had the toxin level that was required from the DP. Yeah, we yeah. have. But so are you going to work to, are you the agency that's going to work? One of the things you got to remember is we're not in control of when the thing was closed and when it wasn't closed. Absolutely. We're not in control of the water level, okay? So it's nice for informational purposes, but you're preaching to the choir because okay. All right. we have no control over that. Okay, next. Right. But let me just say so something else. You're you're done. Done. I've got it, I've got from January which storm drains are polluting the lake. And they aren't necessarily yeah, the ones to show. And so I'd know. like to give those to you. Yeah, All right. Don't don't okay. Anybody else want to speak? Yeah, let me just clarify. Sure. Yeah, um, the Lake of Packman Foundation has uh, <clears throat> conducted a series of meetings now with Greenwood Lake and with Eel Lake as the start of a, a lake organization. And um, the idea is, uh, and Fred has actually been developing a white paper um, of what was wrong with the um, strategy used by the state this past year. I think we all realize yes, that. Yes, the strategy used by the state. We had nothing to do with it. We, we, right. we complained, and, they didn't. And, and I will say, what you just said about Greenwood Lake uh, is, is not correct. I agree with the press. Yeah, it, it, it's not correct because they've been at our meetings. As, as, as upset as we have been over how it was measured. This was for next year, they said. The, the, yeah. Because of the lawsuits. But, you know, it, it, yeah, and hopefully the state will relook their strategy. That's okay. And I, I would like to just officially say that the um, Department of Health can close the beach for any reason. Not just E. coli, not just E. coli, I've been explicitly told they can close it just simply on visual visuals. But they would be saying that the Department's fault, the Department's fault. You have a way of prolonging these conversations. <laughs> Anyone else? Great answer. Yeah, Earl Riley from the uh, uh, Lake Muskinacon Regional Planning Board. Um, I'd like to get the commission to uh, to start thinking about how the commission and how the regional planning board and how um, Marty's organization can start working together, okay, and and sharing resources and utilizing each other's talents um, and 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 personnel, if you will. Um, <clears throat> I just heard Melissa say that that. It costs three hundred fifty thousand dollars to to harvest eighteen hundred uh, twelve and a half how many yes. twelve hundred cubic yards of weeds. Oh my God. Okay. It's 50, it's but, 000. So so yeah so it's 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 probably well over three hundred dollars a cubic yard you're spending to harvest weeds. No, well, let me well the, the, this, this year, that's, that's this year. Yeah, so that's this fiscal year. This year, okay. Last fiscal year was this year, we harvested almost 900 cubic yards, okay, with one harvester and four volunteers at a cost of less than $10 a cubic yard. So, so let's share some resources here and ideas on how we can both become more efficient 
and utilize the resources that are available to us. That's all. We received that you're allowed to. Pardon me? You're allowed to use volunteers. All right, John, please. I have this. All right. Anyone else wish to be heard? Public meeting. We hit item number 16, we've already acted on. Yeah.